Hi everyone. So, uh, welcome to the second day of 180 astrophysics questions. And uh, so I actually just recorded this, but I realized that I did the whole recording without switching uh, the camera from this title page to the actual uh, thing that I was drawing on. So I'm going to re-record it um, and do it again. So let's do the switch. Great. Um, so the question we're going to answer today is uh, explain how a radio interferometer manages to produce sub arc second images when none of the constituent dishes has an angular resolution of better than one arc minute. Uh, so what I'm going to first do is explain uh, uh, what a typical uh, telescope has for its angular resolution and show how radio interferometry is able to do better than that. So, okay, so normally when you have a telescope, um, whether it's a radio telescope or just a, a light telescope or a, a visual light telescope, uh, you have some sort of mirror, some reflecting dish, and what it does is, um, you know, light comes in, it bounces off the mirror, uh, there's probably some other mirror here that then redirects the light out, and you kind of look at it over here. This is your eye. Um, and the, it turns out that the angular resolution, which is, I denote by delta theta, or actually, let me, uh, let me denote it by a different delta. I'm going to use little delta. So I'm going to say delta theta um, is equal to 1.22 lambda over d. Uh, and this d is um, the diameter of your telescope. Uh, sorry, the diameter of the mirror or the lens in your telescope. Um, and so this lambda is the, uh, the wavelength of light that you're looking at. And this d is uh, the diameter of your uh, reflector. Um, and so, and this 1.22 comes from the fact that it's the first zero. Um, this this spot is kind of the first zero of the Airy function, which is um, just kind of what happens when you take into account diffraction and stuff. Um, and actually, actually, it's uh, so uh, in in kind of the the. Um, Best case scenarios, you're uh, able to really get um, a delta theta of probably about one arc second, uh, which is also denoted one with two of these. Um, but when uh, there's a technique called interferometry, which actually is uh, used for radio waves, um, and it actually allows you to get um, an angular resolution of uh, like milli arc seconds. So actually, let wh whatever, just less than an arc second. Um, and you can imagine naively, this is harder for radio because um, this lambda is larger, so you have to make the dish way larger in order for this to work. Um, and there's a telescope called Arecibo. Uh, I forget exactly where it is, but it's basically a gigantic radio dish that's just embedded in the ground. Um, and, I, and the dishes are actually kind of cheaper to make because um, you don't have to grind your uh, mirrors as smoothly. You can just use like wires and stuff. Uh, anyway, that's kind of beside the point. Um, but the point is that this is the sort of angular resolution that you can get. Um, and what angular resolution is, it's basically how well you can distinguish between two things that are on the sky that are coming uh, very close by. So I'm, uh, imagine that um, I have like two spots on the sky that are showing, shining light down at me over here on the Earth. Um, uh, and so they're shining light over here. If I can't, uh, if I don't have the angular resolution to uh, show that these two spots are different, then it's just going to look like one big blur, right? But if I do have the angular resolution, basically um, I'm able to measure the difference between this angle uh, and this angle. So let's say uh, an angle from the vertical, right? So this is like theta 1, uh, and this is some delta, sorry, this is theta, and this is some delta theta, which is the angular distance between these two guys. So basically you want to make your delta theta as small as possible in order to see things with high resolution. Okay, so radio telescopes are actually able to get um, much higher resolution by using a technique called interferometry, and that's what I'm going to explain today. Um, but the basic idea is, let's say, we instead of just having one dish, we're going to have two dishes over here. Um, each dish is going to have its own little capital D size. They don't even have to be identical, I think. But um, the, the other thing is um, about this is that they have some distance between them. And the idea is, um, you know, if we're looking at astronomical sources, those are very far away. And so um, the light that it emits towards this will be roughly parallel. Um, and um, it turns out that we're going to be able to make a measurement that allows us to uh, uh, resolve 
um, something that's coming like that versus something that's kind of coming off like that, right? Um, so basically, we're going to get a much higher angular, angular resolution using this radio interferometer. Um, so the basic idea of how this works is I'm going to now t treat our detectors as little dots. Um, the distance between them is d. And what I'm going to do is just consider one object emitting stuff over at some and its angle position is about theta. Um, and here's the parallel line to that, which is also at coming at angle theta. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this perpendicular down. Uh, from this detector over to the path of that light ray. Um, and if you do your geometry, you'll see that because that was a right angle, this is also an angle theta. So uh, now what we do is we just do a simple calculation for uh, what this path length is over here. So I'm going to call that L, and that's equal to d sine theta. And so that's just, geom uh, that's just geometry um, and trig and stuff. So. Um, the thing about light is, uh, if these two are coming from the same source, then that means that these two uh, light rays are uh, probably coherent. Uh, I actually don't know if they're always like this or not, but let's assume for a second that they're coherent, which means that uh, since this light ray that's coming from very far away, uh, this light ray has to travel this extra distance L. Um, and so since it has to travel that extra distance L, then the light, when it reaches here, is going to be phase shifted. It's going to be phase shifted by an angle. Uh, delta phi is equal to L, sorry, it's equal to, yeah, L over lambda times 2 pi. And so what that means is basically, um, you know, you, if you have a wave that like kind of looks like this, you're basically catching this wave over here on the left uh, at a different point than this wave over here that hits the right detector. Um, so it's like the first detector, say, hits over here. And then this L, you know, the, the wave gets to travel like a little further down, and then so maybe it hits over here. And so that's going to be our delta phi, the phase shift. Um, great. Um, so now what these are actually all the equations we need. So now um, what we're going to do is imagine, um, again, that we have some other source that's uh, displaced an extra delta theta, a little delta theta. And the question is, uh, how well can we? Uh, can, can we tell the difference for that delta theta? Um, and so what we'll do is we'll just do kind of first order Taylor approximations. So uh, I'm going to vary L with respect to theta. So um, that means uh, some small change in L is going to correspond to D, which is constant, times uh, I take the derivative over here. So I get a cosine theta uh, delta theta. OK, great. So that relates basically the change in this path length to uh, what happens as you shift this delta theta around. And then what I'll also do is uh, vary this over here. You get a d delta phi. So remember, this delta phi is something that you measure by uh, basically comparing the output of this uh, this radio dish to the output of this radio dish. Um, so you have to have very good timing and coordination between these. I think it's called correlating um, in order to measure this delta phi. But you can actually do a much better job with that than you can um, like you can you can do that actually fairly well, and it's a lot easier than actually making the dishes huge, um, as we'll see in a second. Um, so anyway, so I was varying this, so we vary um, the delta phi. Oops. Uh, great. Um, and so this L is going to change, but let's assume that we're looking at the same wavelength of light, which means that this just simply becomes that, right? OK, so now we can uh, eliminate delta L, because that was something that we're not actually measuring. The thing we're actually measuring is this d delta phi, which is the difference in the, um, the phase shift between the signal received by this and the signal received by this, right? Um, so let's take these two equations and, and solve. So uh, we then get delta theta is equal to 1 over d cosine theta times uh, this delta L, which will be lambda over 2 pi times delta of delta phi. Great. And so this is kind of, um, this is the thing that's going to kind of limit. Uh, this is the measurement limited thing. Um, but uh, so th this, is, this, is the, this is the key result. And one thing that's really great is that there's a d, a little d down here. Um, which is actually, as you know over here, this is the, the separation between your two radio dishes, which can be much larger than the actual size of the radio dish itself, right? Um, so if you compare these two, um, they're you know, rough, roughly the same, let's say, but 
Um, over here, the delta theta uh, has, uh, is determined by lambda over capital D, which is the size of the reflector. And over here, this, is, uh, this delta theta for your radio interferometer is determined by uh, lambda over little d, which is the distance between two dishes. And that can be very large, right? You just move your dish somewhere else, and you can get more angular resolution by this method. Um, assuming that you can maintain the same uh, accuracy in your ability to correlate. You can imagine that it's harder to correlate the signals between two radio dishes if you move them farther apart. You have to account for things like light travel time and whatever. Um, yeah, so, so that's the upshot, which is that um, you can get these really high angular resolutions because you're able to, uh, essentially because you're just able to move um, you're, you're, you're able to utilize the distance between the dishes. Uh, you can increase that in order to uh, make your angular resolution better. Okay, uh, so that's it. Thanks.